Hey everyone, welcome to Movies To Go. I am your host, Black Cat Loner, your friendly neighborhood cartoon cat ping tuber here for the second episode of this podcast, which is basically a podcast that talks about movies that were released before the current insanity that is modern Hollywood. But today we definitely have a movie that was released before the insanity that is modern Hollywood. And it is a movie that is celebrating an anniversary this year. Last time we reviewed the revenge thriller Falling Down, which was celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. On this week's episode, we will be reviewing a movie celebrating its 40th anniversary. It's a comic book movie, but while Falling Down is more beloved, the movie we're reviewing today is on the other hand, slightly less highly regarded at the time of its release. Whether it's deserved or not, you make the call. So sit back, relax, and when we get back, we're going to talk about Superman 3. Once again to head back to the magical world of the 80s. The 80s was the best decade for movies, the best decade for music, and the best decade for TV. I'm a huge 80s buff. Duh. 80s for the win. The 80s was also the decade where movie franchises that were established in the late 70s as a new breed of movie known as the blockbuster was making itself known. Of course, Star Wars and Jaws led the way in that regard, but one of these said blockbuster franchises that was making itself known in the wake of Star Wars at the time was the Superman franchise. The first movie released in 1978 took the world by storm and made a household name of the late Christopher Reeve for his most human portrayal of the Man of Steel. To this day, many people still consider Reeve's Superman to be the definitive version of the comic book hero. The second movie, released in 1981, or 1980 if you lived in the UK, was just as popular and even to this day, it's still considered one of the greatest comic book movies ever made. However, Superman 2's success was in the shadow of the controversy surrounding producers Alexander and Ilya Salkin's decision to fire original movie director Richard Donner due to a conflict over the production of the movies. Fact is, when Richard Donner was fired, he managed to complete about 75% of Superman 2 before he was replaced by Richard Lester, who was best known for helming the Beatles movies A Hard Day's Night and Help, among many other things. The situation was so tense that original actors Marlon Brando and Gene Hackman refused to return to do reshoots. I'll have more on this in a little bit. After the success of Superman 2, the Salkins wanted to do a third Superman movie, and the original plan was to have the movie set in outer space. The movie was to pit Superman against Brainiac and Mitzelpidelec, and it was going to feature Supergirl. It was rumored that the producers wanted David Bowie to play Brainiac, and popular comedian Dudley Moore was considered for Mitzelpidelec. The plot was to feature a love triangle between Superman, Supergirl, and Brainiac, which resulted in Brainiac turning Superman evil via computer. And the climax would have seen Superman and Supergirl time travel back to the Middle Ages to fight Brainiac, along with Jimmy Olsen and Lana Lang. The end would have had Superman marrying Supergirl, despite the fact that they're actually first cousins in the comics. Although it was interesting on paper, Warner Brothers turned down the original script, citing that it was too complex and too expensive to film. And then came the faithful appearance of Richard Pryor on The Tonight Show, which at the time was hosted by Johnny Carson. On that show, Pryor was talking enthusiastically about going to see Superman 2 in theaters, and he expressed interest in appearing in the Superman movie. The producers were apparently watching that night, and then they thought about it and said, hmm. Why not? After all, Richard Pryor was one of the top box office stars at the time, and they felt that they could do a movie around him and Superman. That while Pryor was likely under the impression that his appearance would be a cameo, but instead it ended up being a huge role. The plot was to be a more down-to-earth plot involving the rise of computers in everyday life. Some plot threads from the original draft, such as Superman becoming evil and bringing in Lana Lang to replace Lois Lane as his love interest, were included in the final draft. But since Richard Pryor was going to be in the movie, writers David and Leslie Newman decided to make the tone of Superman 3 more comedic. 
which in hindsight was probably not a good idea. The budget was set at $39 million, which would put Superman 3 in line with the first two movies. Richard Lester would return to direct, being that he has experience directing comedy, but the production was nearly threatened when Christopher Reeve opted not to return as Superman because he, like everyone else in the cast for the previous two movies, was upset with the producers over the Richard Donner incident. At one point, comedian Tony Danza was set to replace Reeve as Superman, which terrified Richard Lester to the point that he had to practically beg Reeve to come back. He managed to succeed in bringing Reeve back, but only after he allowed Reeve to make some changes to the script. I guess given the tone of the movie, Tony Danza probably would have worked, but seriously, can you imagine Tony Danza as the Man of Steel? Well, gee, Lois, I'll save you. In the end, if they went with Tony Danza, Superman 3 probably would have been a lot worse. Probably making Superman 4 a masterpiece by comparison. Not that I'm about to give Superman 4 anything resembling credit. Oh, and one more thing before I get into the review. I just wanted to say that Superman 3 was the first of only two Superman movies I saw in theaters. The other one being Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice in 2016. And since this movie was released among a slew of other iconic movies that was released 40 years ago, when the box office was dominated by some movie you probably never heard of, oh, I don't know, Revenge of the Jedi or something like that? And I'm sure we'll be looking at some more movies released on that date 40 years ago, but for today, we'll look at Superman 3. So buckle up, make sure your seatbelts and tray tables are in their upright and locked positions, and it's up, up, and away we go. The movie begins with Richard Pryor's character, Gus Gorman, a chronically unemployed, down-on-his-luck bum who is officially cut from collecting unemployment, stumbles onto an opportunity where he can get a job as a computer programmer. And as it turns out, he's a computer whiz. And as far as we know, he likely hasn't touched a computer a day in his life, probably because at that time, computers weren't as everywhere as they are today. Man, this movie was ahead of its time. But we'll get back to that later because in between Gus being cut off from his unemployment and him getting a job as a computer programmer, we have this movie's version of the opening credit sequence. Instead of the traditional outer space title sequence from the first two movies, instead the credits play over a slapstick comedy sequence where random mishaps happen all over Metropolis, basically to set up the overly comedic tone of the movie. Because again, Richard Lester had experience directing slapstick comedy. An act, of course, that didn't really sit well with the fans because it feels more like a parody of Superman with Superman in it. And there is a little Easter egg in that sequence where the kid at the photo booth who unwittingly witnesses Clark turning into Superman because the photo booth happened to be taking pics of him in various stages of undress was actually the same kid who played baby Superman in the first movie. Another fun fact, he also pops up in Man of Steel as an army communications officer. And for those of you who missed the traditional opening credit sequence, an alternate version of the movie, which usually aired on television, has the outer space opening sequence. And by the way, the opening credit sequence that we got in the theatrical cut is among the most criticized parts of the movie. After we would learn about Gus's newfound computer abilities, we cut over to the Daily Planet, where this scene pretty much sets up the whole movie. It's where the villains of the movie, who I will talk about a little bit, are set up. It's where Clark Kent is trying to pitch a story where he gets invited to go back to Smallville, Kansas for his high school reunion. And we also have to set up why Lois Lane, played by Margot Kidder, has only a few minutes of screen time. It's very much debated, even to this day. On the DVD commentary to Superman 3, the producers insisted that reducing Lois's involvement in the movie wasn't to punish Margot Kidder over her stance on the Richard Donner situation, but rather they insisted that the Superman-Lois relationship was drawn out and they decided to bring in Lana Lang instead. And as you know, Lana Lang was Clark's unrequited childhood sweetheart from the first movie. However, we the audience know better. She was, in fact, being punished. So basically, to punish her, they decide to send Lois on vacation to Bermuda, while Perry White agrees to Clark's story idea, and then sends Jimmy Olsen with him to Smallville. However, during the bus trip, Clark and Jimmy stumble onto a chemical plant fire, which is the first real action sequence in the movie. Of course, Clark turns into Superman because he's the only person who can do anything to help. He manages to evacuate the staff, save for one scientist who has to watch over a bunch of containers containing unstable beltric acid, which emits a corrosive vapor when superheated. 
Superman is able to extinguish the fire by freezing the water at a nearby lake with his super breath and flies it over to the fire, creating rain. In the process, Jimmy Olsen is injured while trying to be a hero and get photos of the fire. While Jimmy is back to Metropolis to nurse a broken leg, Clark makes it back to his high school reunion where he reconnects with Lana Lang, played by Annette O'Toole, who appeared in 48 Hours, and the 1990 Stephen King miniseries It. Not to be confused with the two theatrically released It movies, from 2017 to 2019. And as we all know, she will later return to the Superman franchise as Superman's mother, Martha Kent, on Smallville. We learn that Lana is a divorced single mom with a son named Ricky. Clark also runs into Brad Wilson, aka Chuck Cunningham from Happy Days. He used to be the town football star, used to date Lana, and also used to pick on Clark. He's now the stereotypical town drunk who's still trying to hit on Lana and still picks on Clark. And here's where Christopher Reeve portrays Clark with a little more backbone as a opposed to the clumsy, mild-mannered person we know him as, especially in the first two movies. For example, in the bowling alley, he confronts Brad while he is picking on Lana's son, Ricky, who is not very good at bowling, and is able to gently but firmly tell Brad to back off without resorting to violence. Because we know he can completely demolish Brad, but if he did that, the world would probably know he is Superman. And as Superman, he would violate his oath to protect humanity. At one point, Clark even helps Ricky get a strike with the aid of his super breath, masked by a sneeze so people wouldn't suspect nothing. And later, Clark, Lana, and Ricky go on a picnic in the middle of a wheat field, which doesn't really do much except give Clark some more time to form his bond with Lana, and also gives him an opportunity to turn into Superman to rescue Ricky from nearly getting mauled by farm machinery. Okay, we'll come back to Clark in a few minutes, but in the meantime, let's get caught up with Richard Pryor's antics. Shocked that his paycheck is less than what it was advertised, Gus decides to put his computer skills to good use in an attempt to hack the payroll, so he can obtain the quarter senses that seem to disappear. This technique has come to be known as salami slicing, and it works because the next week, in addition to his regular paycheck, he gets another check which totals $85,000. And ladies and gentlemen, we have the plot to office space. However, Gus's antics catch the attention of billionaire philanthropist Ross Webster, played by Robert Vaughn, the movie's main villain, and that is another main problem with the movie, and that is the character's miscast. According to the DVD commentary, the producers originally wanted Frank Langella to play Webster, but they couldn't get him. Although Langella would appear as Perry White in Superman Returns years later. Like I said before, Gus's antics with the salami slicing and managing to hack $85,000 into his account comes to the attention of Ross Webster and his stepsister Vera, played by Annie Ross, who was no stranger to the franchise, being that she dubbed Ursa's voice in Superman 2. We also meet Webster's psychic nutritionist, the hell? Lorelai, played by Pamela Stevenson, who is known for the British SNL show, Not the Nine O'Clock News, who is pretty much another prototype for Harley Quinn. For context, I recently posted a short review of the 1987 Madonna film, Who's That Girl? where I basically said that Madonna's character in that film was also a prototype for Harley Quinn. So basically, Webster may not seem like a typical villain because there's no menace to him. He's pretty much Lex Luthor light. And by that, I mean he's not berating his minions with every setback, but he's frequently calm. In fact, his company, Websco, owns the computer firm that Gus works for. When Gus pulls up to work in a really expensive Ferrari, Webster finally decides to meet Gus and entice him into a scheme to corner the coffee market by way of hacking into a weather satellite. In short, Webster is just a bored billionaire who wants to, you guessed it, take over the world. Of course! And so Webster puts Gus on a bus to Smallville so as to not attract attention in Metropolis, and he's immediately greeted by Clark accidentally whacking him in the junk with a car door. It is also in Smallville where we learn that a company that produces farm equipment, ironically owned by Websco, is also a place where you can control a weather satellite. After getting the night security guy, who also happens to be Chuck Cunningham, drunk, not to mention a bunch of computer-related shenanigans, no doubt foreshadowing the world we live in today, Gus gets control of the weather satellite and proceeds to create hurricane-style weather in Columbia in the hopes that it'll destroy the coffee crop. And next thing you know, we are back in Metropolis where Webster is celebrating the man-made storm that he indirectly caused by skiing at his ski resort that he built on top of his skyscraper. How the fuck does he not fall off the side of the building? Foreshadowing, by the way. 
But anyway, Webster was premature in turning off the news report, otherwise he would have heard that Superman showed up and stopped the man-made tornado. Instead, Webster ends up hearing it from Gus, who shows up apologetically explaining and reenacting Superman's exploits while wearing a pink tablecloth. Sensing that Superman is a threat to his plans, Webster finds out about kryptonite and tells Gus to use the weather satellite to search for kryptonite debris in space. Gus obeys this, but not before he falls off the side of the building while wearing skis in that pink tablecloth and lives. By the way, this was one of the scenes that pissed Christopher Reeve off the most about this movie and made him not want to return as Superman in future movies. Anyway, Gus finds the kryptonite, but soon learns that a mysterious ingredient is missing, so he does what any normal person would do in that situation. He looks at his cigarette wrappers, and fills in the blank with tar. An ingredient found in cigarettes because, like Gus says, what the hell, they don't smoke it. Smoke, smoke, smoke that kryptonite. Gus then heads back to Smallville where Superman was receiving the key to the city because he saved Lana's son's life and that same son blurted out to the whole town that Superman was coming to his birthday party. Disguised as an army general, Gus goes into a monologue which I do admit is one of the few Richard Pryor scenes that do work in this movie and did get a laugh out of me. So anyway, he slips Superman the fake kryptonite and is shocked that the kryptonite didn't have any immediate effects on him. At first it seems like the plan failed, but unbeknownst to Gus, the fake kryptonite begins to change Superman mentally. For starters, he decides to put off rescuing a truck falling off a bridge to hit on Lana, only to arrive there too late to do anything. As a result, Superman becomes more of a super douchebag, doing such douchey things, like straightening the Leaning Tower of Pisa and blowing out the Olympic torch. Kinda jumping the gun a bit, eh, continuity? because the Olympics didn't happen until the following year. Seeing that the fake kryptonite wasn't a total failure, Webster decides to steal the world's oil by having Gus program a series of orders to strand every oil tanker in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in order for Webster to gain a monopoly on the oil. In return, Gus persuades Webster to build him a supercomputer, which will be located near the Grand Canyon. They manage to corral all the tankers into the middle of the Atlantic, but one disobeys orders and continues on to Metropolis. At that instant, Lorelai decides to draw out evil Superman and seduces him into stopping the wayward oil tanker by causing an oil spill. So as a result, evil Superman does not stand for truth, justice in the American way, but instead he stands for mass destruction, boozing it up, and hooking up with blonde bimbos. Then again, it probably was a good thing Lois sat this one out. In the meantime, Lana and Ricky decide to move to Metropolis, but they couldn't have made the move at a worse time because they arrive in time to see Superman drunk in a bar flicking peanuts at mirrors and liquor bottles breaking them. A scene that was referenced in the Arrowverse Supergirl series, where Supergirl also found herself in a bar breaking liquor bottles with peanuts after being exposed to red kryptonite, which in the comics is designed to release Superman's or Supergirl's inhibitions. As Superman flies off, Ricky pleads for Superman to recover from what he's going through and that he will be great again. Wow, just watch some former president use that as a campaign slogan. And we come at last to what is considered the best scene in the movie. The scene where Super Douche fights Clark Kent in the junkyard. I do admit this scene scared me as a kid, especially the scene where evil Superman throws Clark into a car crusher. But to many fans, this was the best scene in the movie and many people go as far as say it's one of the best scenes in the franchise. Eventually, Clark overpowers evil Superman, and that ultimately leads to the most iconic scene in the movie, where he stands up slowly as the John Williams score kicks in, and he slowly rips open his shirt to reveal the clean Superman shield. And so Superman proceeds to clean up the oil spill he caused while under the influence of evil Superman, and then he heads out west where Webster and his minions, including Gus, are getting ready to bring his brand new supercomputer online. As a lot of you may know, Brandon Routh played the Kingdom Come Superman in the Arrowverse crossover event Crisis on Infinite Earths. And it was established that the Kingdom Come Superman is the same Superman that he portrayed in Superman Returns, which in turn is the same Superman that was played by Christopher Reeve. In Crisis on Infinite Earths, Routh's Superman fights the Arrowverse Superman, and following that fight, Routh's Superman says, this is the second time I've gone nuts and fought myself. That line is ironic because Superman Returns was originally supposed to retcon both Supermans 3 and 4 and be a direct sequel only to the first two movies. However, by saying that line, it's very likely that Routh put Superman 3 back in canon. 
Aware that Superman is on his way, Webster and his goons decide to test out the computer's defense systems, with the targeting looking like an old school Atari game, because you know, Atari was the shit at the time of Superman 3. And there is an Atari movie tie-in game planned for Superman 3 for use on the Atari 5200 system. But it never materialized, probably because of the disappointing performance of the movie at the box office. Which is probably for the best, because I doubt it would have been better than the E.T. Atari game. But at least it probably would have been better than Superman 64. And as far as the Atari 5200 goes, well, there's an excellent Angry Video Game Nerd episode about how bad that game system was. So anyway, after surviving being involved in a real-life Atari game, the Man of Steel finally goes into the cave where the supercomputer is located to confront the villains. But then the computer is able to deduce Superman's weaknesses and then zap him with a ray of real kryptonite. Webster is gloating over the success of the computer and congratulates Gus on being the man who killed Superman. However, this is where Gus begins to have an epiphany. Throughout the movie, many people assume that Richard Pryor was the main villain of the movie because his name was above Robert Vaughn's in the credits. But this is not true, because his character is portrayed as kind of a bumbling, harmless everyman who didn't even know he was a computer genius until he got behind a keyboard. Of course, Gus's attempts to sabotage the supercomputer backfires despite managing to save Superman's life as it starts to become self-aware, a precursor to Skynet, as it causes blackouts across the U.S. and turns Webster's ugly sister Vera into a cyborg. Another scene that frightened kids in theaters. Well, even though it didn't bother me very much. I think some people might have used that scene as the case for the PG-13, but it's nowhere near as bad as some other movies that inspired the PG-13 rating. As this is happening, Superman flies off to the chemical plant from the beginning of the movie and retrieves a container of beltric acid, which the supercomputer mistakenly analyzes as harmless. But during Superman's battle with the cyborg Vera and the supercomputer, the acid superheats, destroying the supercomputer. Thankfully, nobody was killed because it's a Superman movie, even though we can't say the same for General Zod, and this was before Man of Steel and also after Superman 2. As a result, Vera returns to normal and then Superman abandons Webster and company to the authorities while he flies Gus to a coal mine in West Virginia where he tries to get Gus a job with computers and also manages to crush a piece of coal into a diamond so he can give Lana a replacement diamond ring as Clark, which annoys Chuck Cunningham who decided to follow Lana to Metropolis for some reason. And of course, he thinks that Clark was proposing to her. He tries to fight Clark, but Clark is able to one-up him without giving himself away. And this is where Chuck Cunningham's story ends until he gets blown up by Charles Bronson in Death Wish 3 two years later. Poor Chuck, he can't catch a break, can he? Clark also manages to get Lana a job at the Daily Planet, and we see Lois back from her vacation in Bermuda with a tan, and a story about tourism corruption, and she's surprised that Clark gave Lana a diamond ring, which seems to imply that Lois still knows Clark as Superman, despite the magic kiss from the last movie. But before Clark can take Lana to lunch, he has to end the movie as Superman, fixing one last little piece of damage that evil Superman did, and that is to make the Leaning Tower of Pisa lean again. And there you go, folks. Superman and three in a nutshell. For all its faults, people tend to forget that there are some good things about Superman 3. For starters, Christopher Reeve is still in top form. This was actually Reeve at his physical peak in the role. Despite the fact that he had less screen time than Richard Pryor, but with what screen time he has, he makes it count. In fact, many would argue that this portrayal of Superman was one of his best roles of his career, mainly because he's playing four roles instead of the usual two. Like I said before, for starters, he gave Clark a little more of a backbone without completely giving himself away as Superman. And he also does an excellent job playing evil Superman when he becomes corrupted by the fake kryptonite. What also works is the subplot with Lana Lang. I actually found myself liking that. Annette O'Toole is pretty decent in the role and actually seems like she's a better fit for Clark than Lois does. I mean, Lois, of course, is still hung up on Superman. Plus, Lana brings out Clark slash Superman's humanity a lot better than Lois did in the other movies. And also what works in Superman 3 is the visual effects. Most notably the flying effects and the scene during the chemical plant fire where Superman freezes an entire lake with a super breath and uses it to put out the fire. Also the effects with the supercomputer and cyborg Vera still hold up. I mean, if you want bad visual effects in a Superman movie, see the next movie. Now to sum up what doesn't work. First up, the main story. 
which was written to be a comedy to accommodate Richard Pryor. And considering that the writers were David and Leslie Newman, who also co-wrote the first two movies alongside Godfather creator Mario Puzo, this is inexcusable because those two should know better. The villains were too weak, and like I said before, Robert Vaughn was miscast. The returning cast member roles were way too short, and did I mention Richard Pryor? And even worse, the person who thought putting Richard Pryor in a Superman movie was a good idea? Even Pryor himself was not happy with the movie because he was hoping Superman 3 would help him branch out into more serious roles. But instead, Richard Lester just told him, be funny. And as I said before, I think Pryor was thinking that his role in Superman 3 was going to be a cameo. And I agree with him. I mean, if you want to put Richard Pryor in a Superman movie, give him a cameo. Don't give him more screen time than Superman. I go to a Superman movie to see Superman. I don't go to a Superman movie to see Richard Pryor. Another kind of slightly morbid thing of note here is that, as of this episode, only three members of the main Superman 3 cast are still alive. Mark McClure, who played Jimmy Olsen, Annette O'Toole, Lana Lang, and Pamela Stevenson, Lorelai the Bimbo. And going back to Richard Pryor, just think a second. This same fate almost befell Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, when Eddie Murphy expressed interest in being in a Star Trek movie. Like Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy was Paramount's biggest star at the time, and Star Trek was one of Paramount's biggest franchises at the time. Eddie eventually turned it down because he didn't like the direction the script was going at the time, but I often like to think that Harve Bennett, who produced Star Trek IV, watched Superman III and thought, no, we can't do this. But whether or not Star Trek IV would have ended up like Superman III with Eddie Murphy in it or not is still up for debate. I mean, I like to think it would be interesting. I'm sure it would have been less of a dumpster fire than this was, but you know, like I said, it's up for debate. Like I said before, there are some Richard Pryor moments that do work, like the salami slicing scene, and also like the army general scene where he gives Superman the fake kryptonite. But too much Richard Pryor comedy in a Superman movie is not always a good idea. Although not necessarily a super flop, 80 million worldwide against a $39 million budget, Compared to the first two movies, it was a critical and commercial disappointment. It also holds a 30% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes and an even lower audience score of 23%. So in closing, is Superman 3 really as bad as people say it is? Well, it's not as good as the first two, but it doesn't completely suck. I don't think that Superman 3 is as bad as its reputation implies, and I kind of view the movie as a guilty pleasure. And yes, Superman 3 does have its fans that include Baby Driver and Shaun of the Dead director Edgar Wright and Beavis and Butthead creator Mike Judge, who of course, because of Superman 3, also created Office Space. The movie's not good, but there are redeemable factors in this movie. It's stupid, but it's enjoyable. And as far as enjoyable goes, you could do worse. And when it comes to Superman, you'll see worse in the next movie. So basically, take Superman 3 for what it's worth. But we'll actually save the movie that killed the Superman franchise for another episode. And there you go. Another episode in the books. So once again, thanks for watching and listening and all that stuff. I'm Black Hat Loner and I will see you next time. Same Black Hat time, same Black Hat channel. Mm -hmm.